The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to this MCA webinar on machine maintenance, easy ways to make your machine last longer. My name is Carrie Hitchner and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Motion Control Association. This webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions panel of your webinar screen and we will answer all questions via email after the webinar has concluded. I'd now like to introduce our webinar presenter today. Her name is Kristen Lewatsky. Kristen is a contributing editor for Motion Control Online and has written about motion control and automation for more than seven years. As a technical writer, she covers a variety of subjects ranging from memory and microelectronics to nanotechnology, lasers, and photonics. Kristen previously worked as an engineer on NASA's Chandra X-ray telescope before switching to writing about technology. Kristen holds a BS in physics and a master's in optics and photonics from the University of Central Florida. I would also like to thank our sponsor today, KNS Services, for supporting this webinar. KNS has over 25 years of experience providing automation repair to a wide range of industries, including automotive, aerospace, tire and rubber, flight simulation, and the steel industry. KNS provides additional services such as repairable asset management programs and offering remanufactured parts instead of buying new. KNS's repair capabilities include PLCs, robot controls, ACDC drives, welder controls, servo motors, vacuum pumps and blowers, servo valves, gearboxes, and precision spindles. Our robot lab has KNS's robot lab has over 35 robots that provide a system test environment with the latest addition of the ABB S4C Plus control. Now I'd like to hand it over to Kristen to begin today's presentation. So Kristen, you can take it away. All right. Um, thank you, Carrie. And thanks to everybody for attending. And of course, thank you to our sponsor, Kenneth. Um, let's talk about maintenance. Kind of one of the, and you'll forgive me for a little bit of motherhood here, I realize everybody on the call understands the importance of maintenance or you wouldn't be here, but there's always room for a little motherhood. Um, it's one of those tasks, it's like with your car or anything else, you know you need to do it. There are a million other things competing for time and resources and justifying it to uh, get the staffing, get the resources can be challenging. You know, It does take a certain amount of time, it consumes resources. Um, uh, on uh, most occasions, the assets need to be offline, and depending on the uh, particular machine that you're working with, that can be a problem if you only get you know, once a quarter or once a month time to get in and do that. Um, on the face of it, that would seem to reduce productivity, although we all know when it comes to downtime, there's nothing that takes care of that productivity faster than that. Um, and of course, it costs money. Um, next slide, Carrie, please. But on the other hand, justifying is pretty straightforward because if you want to maximize throughput, you've got to have your machine operating at best um, point. You know, you want it to be operating as it did at baseline. You don't want it to do that slow, gradual um, fall off in throughput. You don't obviously want to have sudden, unexpected the downtime, you know, the throughput that you save by skipping all that maintenance and the money that you save by that is going to get eaten up pretty quickly when you're down for a weekend or you're waiting for eight hours for your integrator to get there to get your line back up and running. Um, quality of parts, too, you're not going to get anywhere if you're putting out trash because your machine is not operating correctly and if you're in spec, you're just in spec, that's not going to make customers happy. Um, so basically you're positioning the organization to maximize revenue. Um, so we think the case is pretty clear. Uh, next slide. And just as a reminder, OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, 
we are talking here about availability, performance, quality. Um, availability comes directly back to MTBF, mean time between failures, and the mean time to repair. And that is going to um, directly be affected by your maintenance, your performance comes down to your average cycle time and your actual cycle time. Both of these are going to be affected if you're having jams or if your machine is just not able to run up to speed. Uh, and obviously your quality is your percentage of the good parts. So um, maintenance, once again, helps you address all of these. Uh, on to the next. And for those of you of a, uh, a certain age, you might remember Fram Oil had a uh, an advertisement in the uh, 70s with a guy talking about how, you know, you can pay me now with a $4 oil filter or you can pay me later with a $200 valve job. And that's pretty much the core argument of maintenance. So um, let's talk about actually some of the details that we've got going on here. Um, maintenance has evolved, you know, started out in the 50s, you know, the old saw, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So you wait, you run things, things break down, you fix it, you replace, you restart the line. Um, and that means filled buffers, that means lost productivity, potentially, you know, catastrophic damage depending on the breakdown. Um, next layer up was preventative maintenance. And that was based on lifetime, based on database input input from vendors, basically trying to get there a little bit ahead um, in order to, again, forestall downtime, which is definitely helpful. But in some cases, you're replacing things before they need to be replaced, which means you're not getting your full money's worth out of your equipment investment. Um, so the next level up the chain is going to predictive maintenance. And that's something where you're actually trying to figure out when things are getting close to needing to be replaced. And that's really been enabled by a lot of uh, what's going on with the smart components these days. You know, that's an ongoing trend. We had a webcast on that last month. And actually, a feature is going to be going up on uh, Motion Control Online later this month uh, covering integration and kind of the the levels that it can bring to your operations. You know, having that level of intelligence, all of a sudden you've got motors and drives that are able to monitor themselves and flag uh, the operator through the HMI or flag maintenance, let them know when it's time, you know, the, the current is starting to run high or you've got high temperatures, you've got issues coming up. Um, and that, that way you get in there a little bit ahead. The question is, how far ahead can you get there? And how much time uh, and money is that going to save you? So we've been sort of moving to the next level of ideal model, which is proactive maintenance. And that's something where we're using some of these smart components and levels of integration increasingly available and also connectivity across the machine and across the production floor, using all of that to monitor not just the components, but the actual performance of the machine to detect when there are, are issues happening that are likely to cause wear and cause problems. We're going to talk in more detail about all these things uh, as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the kind of cornerstone of preventative maintenance is lubrication. Um, that's uh, you know, the, the key role for lubrication is to separate your moving parts. And motion control is pretty much about motion. So you've got that going throughout the system. You've got um, actuators. You've got gearboxes. You've got bearings. And lubrication gets in there. It's going to decrease your friction, and that's going to reduce your wear, it's going to reduce your heat. And doing it right can do a lot toward making your system last. Doing it wrong can have a real very high cost. In fact, uh, there's an estimate that 40 to 50% of bearing failures 
are caused by improper lubrication. Um, and that right there can stop being in your track because bearings don't generally just sort of casually wear them. They fail. They fail big time. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind right there. Um, next slide, please. So the key pitfalls uh, to lubrication, it seems like it ought to be sort of a simple thing, but there are a lot of misunderstandings around it. First and foremost, people use incorrect lubricants. They don't apply them properly. They do it in a way that introduces contamination, which is basically like having, you know, grinding powder in whatever's trying to move. Uh, and they're also not optimizing how they are um, doing this level of preventative maintenance. Next slide. So just kind of a lubricants 101. The key thing that you care about with lubricants, whether it's oil or grease, is the viscosity, the resistance to flow, because what you're trying to do is keep that barrier between the moving parts and make sure that they are going to continue to be protected. Um, the key classifications are the mineral type or synthetic. Um, you have a concern about thermal characteristics, freezing point, boiling point. That's all going to come down to um, the operating environment. Um, and you want to make sure that your uh, oil or grease can stand up to that obviously, and especially over the course of lifetime, because that's going to govern how often you're going to have to be out there relubricating. And certainly, in certain equipment, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get in to be able to uh, relubricate or change out. So that's important to get that right. Um, protective characteristics are kind of the next level. These are sort of the extra bits, antioxidants, corrosion inhibitors rust inhibitors, um, materials that allow it to take more pressure without being squeezed away. That's obviously very important. High loads when you've got uh, surface to surface. And you need to worry about its stability, uh, its resistance to deemulsifying, its resistance to foaming. You know, again, you're looking for something that's going to last over the long haul. Next slide. And then there's grease. Um, a lot of misunderstandings out there about grease. You hear people talk about, you know, we've got lithium grease, we've got polyurea grease. Those refer to the thickeners. And it's really kind of the least important, from an operational standpoint, it's the least important aspect of a grease. I mean, basically, a grease is an oil that's got additives and thickeners. It's to make sure that it holds the oil on the surfaces. Because if you've got a surface that's moving very fast, um, you know, high speed, or it's very, very hot, it's hard to keep oil in place. So that's why you use grease. But what you really care about there, remember what we talked about in the previous slide, you're really interested in the base oil. How effective is that oil going to be at uh, protecting those surfaces? So. Is it synthetic? Is it uh, mineral-based? Is it uh, the right viscosity that you need? Do you have the additives that you need in there for corrosion protection or whatever? Um, thickener is, from a property standpoint, very far down in the, the level of importance. And yet you kind of get, you know, again, people talk about, oh, I'm using a you know, polyurea grease. Uh, it's sort of like saying I'm using the grease in a red can. You really want to be thinking of the same you know, as with car motor oil, 10W30. That's talking about uh, the actual properties of the oil. So just to keep in mind. Um, next slide. So the first pitfall uh, that commonly happens is you get the wrong lubricant in there, um, wrong viscosity wrong additive system. It's not appropriate for your environmental conditions. Now, most manufacturers will make recommendations of the type of grease to use, but that doesn't always happen. Um, 
a matter of fact, I did a case study a couple of years ago on a company that uh, did 3D printing machines. And they started having a whole lot of return um, on their motors. And they were thinking, hey, wait, you know, what's wrong? I thought we had good motors here, and um, we're getting all of this sent back. So they started talking to their motor supplier. And come to find out, what was actually happening is it wasn't the motor. It was the uh, gearhead was wearing out early. They took everything apart. They looked at the gearhead. It was absolutely um, broken down and worn out. And as they did more tests, they realized that looking at it, the lubricant in the gearhead had completely broken down. It was lacquer. Um, and they looked into it further, and they realized that the problem was that the manufacturer was using the wrong grease. They were just sticking in what they thought was OK, and it wasn't up to the task. Um, so the, manu the motor vendor specified a new grease. They repacked the gearheads, and you know things went much, much better to a point. But they were still getting you know three or four failures a month, and they didn't think that was quite right. And what they discovered is because the new grease and the gearhead was so thick, it was actually burning out the motors early because now the motors weren't powerful enough. So it, it really it seems like it ought to be an easy, obvious thing, but it can be a pitfall. So you got to make sure that you know what you're supposed to be using, that you talk with your vendor if you're swapping out, um, that you know what you're swapping out about. I mean, you can you can get run in circles. If a vendor, if you have vendors that are giving you um, lubricant recommendations by brand, um, what you really want to find again with the whole car lubricant is, you know, 10W30, whatever the viscosity and type and additive. That's what you care about. You need to find that out about. But you need to make sure you do it right, or you're going to be um, running rings for a couple of months like these guys were. Um, so that's that. Another common mistake is mixing incompatible lubricants. Um, because if you do that, you're going to uh, totally impact the lifetime of the lubricant. You're going to get an increase or a decrease in consistency. It's not going to be able to stand up um, to the wear that you've got. You're not going to get a catastrophic failure, but you are going to get failure. And it's going to happen sooner than you think. So by kind of rushing or trying to either cut corners or even having something where you know somebody on a weekend needed lubricant or whatever, if it's not clearly marked and there's not a clear procedure, you can wind up with a mix-up. And then you've got to completely clear out all the old grease because you can't have you know any contamination at that point. Not contamination, but any residue of the, the wrong uh, lubricant, or you're going to run into the same problem over again. So it's definitely worth the investment of making sure that people understand what it is they're supposed to be using and how it is they're supposed to do it. Uh, next slide, please. And that comes to the next pitfall, which is improper application. Um, one, app, you know, one issue that you can have is overfilling depending on what you're doing, especially if it's an oil. You can get too much pressure in there. That can be a problem. Um, another is when you're putting in oil or grease, um, not using best practices so that you're letting in contamination, you're letting in moist air. You know, again, because contamination is basically you're adding an abrasive and you know, with your oil, and you're doing a really nice job of just milling down all your uh, moving surfaces that you're supposed to be protecting with the lubrication. So, um, and you know, some systems have filters, filtration in the uh, um, system to pull some of that out. But preventing it from getting in there to begin with is a, a lot more effective of an approach. Um, another common mistake, and it seems counterintuitive, but replenishing too much. I mean, you, you get folks out there who are saying, hey, we're really good. We do our, our lubrication, and we 
we do it once a month, whether we need it or not, and you know we, we're organized, we're on top of it. But if that's more frequent than your system actually needs, all you're doing is um, creating more opportunities for mistakes. You have more opportunities for people to put in the wrong lubricant or to overfill it or contaminate or whatever. You really you need to determine your replenishment um, cycle by the amount of contact you've got, by the um, relative speed of the moving surfaces. You know, don't don't add in the extra chances for error. Um, but you know, if you're going to be replenishing, you want to do it right. You want to, you know, like in this picture here, you know, open up the um, stopcock, the overflow plug um, up at the top. You want to fill it at the bottom with the zerk and make sure that you've got it packed full enough um, that it's starting to come out at the uh, top so that you know that you're all set. Um, you know, it's understanding and making sure that it's not just a lubrication specialist who's like the the staff guru, but somebody on every shift knows what they're doing in case something comes up and they wind up having to lubricate. You don't want them going and grabbing the wrong lubricant or doing it improperly because long term that can hurt you. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, our favorite contamination. Um, you know, primarily when it comes to lubricants, equipment fails by wearing out. Uh, you know, bearings being the exception, uh, they they kind of tend to do it a little more festively. Uh, but you need to make sure you've got a strategy for dealing with contamination. I mean, you really you really need to have a strategy and training in place for lubrication. Period. But especially, you know, you need to have uh, criteria for how clean the oil should be how much moisture you can tolerate, um, make sure that you've got ways to monitor, make sure that you've got processes in place. And you know, again, that somebody on every shift understands these so that you don't wind up with mistakes that are going to come and hurt you down the line. Next slide. Because you know, maintenance, there is a lot going on. And especially when you are talking about um, you know, 24/7 type operations. Whether it's you know, paper, it's glass, it's um, these high-duty cycle machines. Sometimes there aren't opportunities to stop. And even if you should be lubricating on a regular basis, if all you get is you know, regular scheduled downtime once a month or once a quarter, you've got a ton of stuff going on during that downtime. You've got limited people. You got limited hours. You got the machinery stopped. You know, you've got to get in there and replace items. You've got to, you know, adjust belts. You've got to update firmware. You've got to run through and do, you know, cleaning or anything that can't be done unless the line is stopped. And the unfortunate thing is, a lot of times lubrication gets pushed way down the line, especially, you know, if you've got a few dozen uh, or more components that need to be lubricated. It's really easy to push it aside. Um, next slide, please. And get to feeling like this. So uh, next slide. But there are techniques that you can do even in these situations that can actually make it more manageable. Uh, next slide. And the first thing is have a plan. Again, this is strategy. You need to go through and identify all the components that need lubrication, and then you start asking questions. Um, just because they need lubrication, do they all have to have it? Are there cases in which you can extend the service intervals? And I know I've just been talking about how it's important not to miss on this stuff, but in some case, you know, maybe you wind up going with a synthetic base oil because that's going to give you a longer lifetime. Maybe you um, wind up taking a look at which components you spend the time lubricating and which you don't. Um, it's bearings. Maybe you want lube for life, and you're just going to go ahead and run them to failure uh, because 
if, if it's something that's non-critical, um, you know, maybe that's a better decision in the limited amount of time that you've got. So starting out with a strategy is important. Next slide. And then at the next level, uh, follow best practices. Again, you've got to keep components clean. You've got to keep the moisture in, the particulates out. Uh, in particular, when you're adding components and so on. Um, another technique that can be used uh, with a certain amount of success is something called bleed and feed. And in a case like that, you're, you're basically trying to stay ahead of breakdown and kind of do an ongoing upgrade, if you will. So you take out a certain amount of oil every time while you know, things are still going. Uh, and add in a little bit of oil. So instead of totally draining a gearbox or whatever, you're just taking out some, you're adding some in. It's going to refresh your additives. So the, the things that are preventing breakdown and corrosion and so on uh, are, are going to remain uh, in place. Uh, and oh, I just saw a typo. Um, properly done, it can extend your maintenance interval but you've got to stay on top of it. The thing that you can't do is run too long, let the oil fail, and then try to get in there and do it bleed and feed because that's not going to work. All that's going to happen there is your oxidized oil is going to cause the new oil to oxidize, and that's not going to get anybody anywhere. So it's, it's a viable technique, but you do need to stay on top of it. Um, one of the things that you can do to also kind of take some of the load off your maintenance folks is to um, use your operators. Those folks are on the machine, you know, shift in, shift out, and you can teach them the things that they need to do to be able to flag um, early warning when oil and grease is getting to the point that it needs to uh, be replaced. And that way you're not having your maintenance folks run around and check, you know, two or three hundred sites every uh, couple of weeks. So you can have them check the oil levels. They can look for bad oil. They can look for leaks. Spend a little time training and you're going to get a pretty good bang for your buck. Next slide. Um, so that's uh, preventative maintenance. Let's talk about predictive maintenance, um, things like cabling. Um, I think pretty much everybody knows single biggest point of failure, especially if you've got long runs and they're flexing, you know, you're going to have problems with breakage over time. And they can make you crazy because very often it's intermittent failures with these kind of breaks and that's a pain in the neck. Um, it's a particular issue when you're dealing with special um, challenges. You get a high radiation environment that can cause your insulation to break down. Vacuum environments can cause early degradation. Uh, next slide, please. But you can go ahead and try to do some things to address this. Uh, proper installation practices, again, you know, this is kind of one of those motherhood things, but you'd be amazed at um, what you see. Wonder, well, maybe you wouldn't wandering around factories. I mean, it's just as simple as the uh, you know, upper left-hand um, image there with the you know, giving enough bend radius when you're plugging something in so you're not putting stress on the cable. You know, don't crank down the cable ties to within an inch of their life so that you're um, damaging the cable. You can use um, high flex cables. They're designed specifically for they've got slender strands of wire, they tolerate better deformation, they've got, they're used with materials that can deal with flex, and they've got better strength members. Uh, another thing that is increasingly providing a solution is using distributed control. Uh, and that was, you know, with your smart components, when you've got, um, you know, smart motor drives, you've got drives that can hang out on the machine as opposed to getting wired back to a cabinet or you know having the motor uh, get wired back to the cabinet with the drives and the controller and you know quite aside from saving money and stuff 
you also wind up with fewer points of failure, less cabling, um, less cost outlay because that stuff's not cheap, uh, and, and fewer surprise downtime opportunities. Now, integration has been getting increasingly interesting here the last few years. You know, it was for a while the smart components argument was, you know, they're good for simple motion. You can't do anything really sophisticated. You can't draw circles or whatever. Um, that's not the case anymore. The integrated components that are out there now are able to do some pretty sophisticated motion. So it's increasingly a good way uh, for many applications to get around some of these issues with cabling. Uh, next slide. Another predictive maintenance I was talking about this earlier with the whole uh, smart components. You know, you've got uh, drives that can monitor motor current and flag the operator or flag maintenance when uh, they're changing torque demands. And, you know, that could be some sort of a small obstacle. It could be a contaminated bearing or one that's starting to burn out. It can be something caused by lubrication breakdown. It's Kind of an early warning, it still requires investigation, but it certainly you know, beats just having something fail. So that's kind of the start of the whole predictive maintenance thing. Uh, next slide, please. Now, more recently, again, as I was talking about some of these smart components, you're actually getting more sophisticated capabilities. You're starting to get smart components that are able to really track their own usage and their own wear. Um, you know, in-rush charges on the bus, if you've got a shared bus, that uh, causes you know, wear and stresses the component over time. Now, you might think the protocol calls for you know, start up at the start of the shift and shut down at the end of the shift, but if you've got components that can really track closely, you may find that you've got somebody pressing the e-stop or, or having a fault out multiple times during a shift. So instead of having, you know, one uh, interest charge on the bus, you've got multiple a day, which means your component is wearing faster. And that's where having some of these smart components that are able to monitor their own condition and operation that can be huge. And you've got fans that can monitor their own operating hours. No, sure, you can go ahead and write that down. But it takes time. It distracts people from other things they could be doing. It can be forgotten about. It's a real different, um, hold on, real different situation. So it's actually great having the smart components. And then you have the freedom to, um, choose the response that you want. Maybe the result is something shows up on the HMI. Maybe a flag gets sent. If you've got shop floor, top floor, you can send a message to maintenance. Maybe the default is put it on the regular scheduled maintenance. Maybe you have a different policy for e-stop or start-stop of the, of the line when your shift starts. So. You've got options because you've got information, basically. Uh, next slide, please. And then the next level up, as we talked about before, is your proactive maintenance. And that goes beyond just components monitoring themselves. And it goes beyond using modeling, using experience to determine when to replace. Uh, it's really taking kind of a holistic, if you will, look at the machine. Uh, next slide. And as the song goes, when you're a kid, you know, the arm bone's connected to the elbow bone and the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone. Machines are sort of connected living beings. And if you wind up with a belt loosening somewhere on a, you know, 20, 30, 100 axis machine, that's going to affect how the rest of the machine operates. And all of a sudden, you're going to be changing your resonance point. Now, when the machine was commissioned, when it was designed, and then commissioned, you had notch filters in there that were screening out certain frequencies to try to avoid those resonances. Well, once your resonance points change,
received. All those notch filters are targeting the wrong frequencies. So your servo sends out a tune. And it sounds like you've got a problem. You get maintenance out there with a the laptop, all set to go to work. But the real problem is not the servo, and it's not going to be fixed with the laptop. The problem is mechanical. And what you really need is um, a wrench that's going to get out there and tension the belt. And uh, the problem is if you're trying to deal with this through a servo, then you know, you're, you're going to be impacting your performance. Retuning your servo is not going to get you back to baseline because, again, your problem is not mechanical. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as, a, as an example of what I'm talking about with this stuff, I'm talking about um, tracking vibration. You know, the way it used to be done is you get an accelerometer, on the motor shaft, and you gather data, you do a frequency analysis on it, you figure out your frequency response, and that's going to give you indications of certain kinds of wear and failure. Um, but it requires expertise, requires equipment. It's something that's done offline, so it's very much reactive, not proactive. You know, another thing you can be looking at is, you know, how many what's part count for this hour. You know, what's the yield? What's the quality? Uh, and it, that's important data, but again, it's reactive and it takes resources. Um, new way is a lot of these intelligent drives now have analysis capabilities, and they can take advantage of um, high-resolution encoder input and and keep track of different vibration modes. They can characterize um, error and overshoot, look at your frequency response. Now remember we were talking about the belt earlier. If the resonant frequency on the machine with the belt shifting goes to a lower resonant frequency, that's because your belt isn't tensioned enough. It goes to a higher resonant frequency, the belt's tensioned too much. So it can actually help you target the problems and understand also the changes that you need to make. And this is all coming from basically components on the machine acting as smart sensors to support you. Um, next slide, please. I'm trying to advance it on my computer keyboard, and I'm wondering why it's not working. Um, yeah, so more of this interconnectedness of things. We've got um, the you know, design example. I mean, if you think in terms of um, doing, you know, tuning a servo, really stiff PID loop. You want super fast settling time. You want ultra small overshoot. You want to get where you're going, and you want to stop there, bang. The problem is you're not in an isolated system. You might have this axis and this motor set to be really stiff and get you where you want to go. But if you've got resonance downstream, if you've got the compliant coupling, all of a sudden, you can have you know a nice steady motor shaft, and your load is going nuts. So that's the important thing to keep in mind as you're talking about a system, and that's going to have effects. Um, and then part of what that's going to be doing too is causing wear uh, elsewhere in the system. Um, you have to think in terms of what anything that you do at one point in the system, how it's going to affect elsewhere, and that's again where having some of these diagnostic capabilities that are proactive is really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. And at this point in time, they're really starting to get to be some interesting tools out there. Um, auto tuning has been around for a bit. You know, it started out you had to, you know, take an oscilloscope out and do the tuning on your own, and then we got the auto tuning that would kind of get you to a first approximation, but you still had to get out there and fine-tune. Um, more recently, the auto-tuning has gotten pretty good to where you really can expect that you're going to be close to where you need to be by the time the routine is done. Um, but what's coming out more recently is actually adaptive auto-tuning, where the system can figure out that there's a problem 
and it can go ahead and do the tuning for you. So you don't have to do it. It happens automatically. It happens right away. You know, let's talk about our belt example again. If your system is monitoring and it detects the resonance outside of those notch filters that you have set, um, it determines where it's coming from. It, it readjusts the parameters, gets you back to optimal information, or optimal operation, I should say. Um, even with minor variations in the system, you can still get very, very good performance. And it's something where you don't have to go running around on the floor with a laptop. You can basically push a button, and the system reconfigures. Uh, it doesn't reconfigure. It re-optimizes, uh, retunes, and you're up and rolling again. Um, and, and that's really important. And when you have um, some of these kinds of resonances coming in, you know, it can start out as something small. You know, you get a worn component or whatever, and maybe the effect is, you know, an error that re represents a fractional part per hour. But long term, if you leave it alone, that's what's going to potentially be able to take your system down. So you really have to stay on top of this. Um, the capabilities of doing this also give you some really important diagnostic information because you can characterize machine performance. You can look at the friction, the losses, the resonances. You know, take a scan at baseline. You look at it three months, six months, you know, intervals, two years. Um, plot the trajectory and look at your maintenance intervals and see what it tells you. You may be able to find that you're able to um, stretch out some of your intervals. It may be that you're stable for six months, and then you know, right before two years, things start to go south. That's all information that you can gather through some of these um, new components. And something like lubrication, which is um, can easily be kind of a, a trial and error, really can be, start to become a closed a closed loop process that you can you know, kind of play with your scheduling and optimize um, downtime. So, uh, let's see. And once again, I am trying to advance on the wrong computer. It doesn't help me at all. Um, let's see. New slide, please. Now, thing to keep in mind here, the auto-tuning capabilities are really cool and uh, add a huge amount of functionality and remove headaches, but it cuts both ways. The downside of auto-tuning is it is so good at um, optimizing performance that it can mask serious problems. So maybe uh, you've got you know that belt problem or whatever. If you're doing auto tuning, you know your servo still sounds pretty good. You think everything is fine. The machine's um, you know compensating by the tuning. So you think everything is okay. It's still overshooting, uh, or I'm sorry, it's not overshooting but it's also not doing what you were expecting it to do and what it did at baseline. And you know, again, here's where things start slowing down just a little bit, and we're starting to get back into the OEE territory where you're looking at your throughput and going, gosh, why, why does that system no longer run quite as fast as it used to? So that's where you can get a little too cute um, trying to dampen vibrations and so on um, if you are you have a bigger problem. So just kind of a caution. Uh, next slide, please. One of the ways that uh, vendors are dealing with that is to make, kind of add even more intelligence into the system so that when you've got the system doing the auto-tuning and making the adjustments, the um, control system says, OK, great. We managed to get you all retuned. Everything's all fixed up. But I'm also going to go ahead and send something to maintenance so that they are aware that there is a new resonance point, that something is changing. And you want to make sure that uh, you got and you check it and don't just sort of blithely uh, keep moving forward. So that seems to be a good fix for that for now. Give it time, and I'm sure the components will get even smarter and even better. And, 
Uh, we'll have new ways to eliminate headaches. Um, next slide, please. So that about rounds it up. Uh, again, you know, motherhood, but lubrication, you got to do it. It's going to increase lifetime. It's going to cut wear. Uh, predictive maintenance, that's where we start getting into that intelligence. Condition monitoring components are a lot more capable than you ever would have thought, you know, 10 years ago. They can do quite sophisticated motion, and they're also able to uh, do, do a lot of uh, condition monitoring, condition reporting, and proactive. Uh, pretty soon here, the sky's going to be the limit with the amount of intelligence and memory that we've got in these components. So you're going to be able to find out well in advance of problems what's going on with your system. Um, and I think that about sums it up. Thanks again to our sponsors. There are a few, I just want to bring your attention, there are a few um, educational pieces on their website. You might want to pop by and take a look. One is on uh, grease problems with motors and brakes. There's a piece on servo motor troubleshooting, um, extending servo valve performance. There are a few others there. You um, might want to stop by and take a look. And other than that, I think that is all I had to cover for today. If you have questions or you need to get those uh, links, feel free to reach out to me. And otherwise, thanks for your time. Thanks, Kristen. And I want to thank all of our participants today and our sponsor, of course, um, k &S Services. I just want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded, and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you in the next 24 hours. If you have any questions on the presentation material at all, please feel free to email Kristen or myself, and uh, Kristen's email is on the screen right now. And also be sure to visit www.motioncontrolonline.org for a list of our upcoming webinars. Our next webinar is uh, titled Driving Your Motor from Novice to Expert, and that is scheduled for Tuesday, November 9th. Thank you, everyone, oh, and have – oh, yep, I'm sorry, Kristen, did oh, you sorry, have anything here. to add? Um, also, I'm going to be uh, – we'll be putting up a feature on maintenance that's going to have additional information, and that's going to go up in December. Perfect. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks, everyone, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, guys.